right. So basically, uh, in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, I will do a summary of uh, what has been the main, uh, I would say, burning topics during this uh, last medium uh, So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, those uh, abstracts. Uh, I'd like first to apologize for the abstracts I would not select uh, and for the others. I mean, it's impossible to, of course, do a listing of all what has been presented. So I have to do some focus on what I found that are the most striking things and the most changing practice that has been presented. So I'm Regis Pefoulato. I'm uh, uh, chairing the uh, French Reference Center for Plastic and and PNH. And I'm the head of the Department for Transplantation in uh, Saint Louis Hospital in, in uh, Paris. So those are my uh, disclosures. So as you know, um, the landscape I will address uh, this morning uh, is about inherited disorders to acquire uh, a plastic anemia and PNH, and then all those conditions uh, being able to move to MDS and AML. I will, of course, need not speak about AML. I was not my task. So the first abstract I selected was. Uh, this one uh, on Fanconi anemia patients. It is a work that has been done uh, by the uh, Severe Plastic Anemia Working Party. Uh, this is more than 100 patients. Um, and uh, this is the only study that was addressing uh, transplantation uh, in such a number of patients uh, in pediatric setting. So uh, the idea was really to address the uh, very recent period of time uh, since 2010 to 2018 only pediatric patients who receive a first transplantation. The main interest was really to look on GVHD-free uh, relapse-free survival. In other words, we do know that in Fanconi patients, uh, what is motivating, and I would say conditioning the prognosis long-term is definitely the uh, GVHD. GVHD is associated with infections, <clears throat> but there's always secondary malignancies uh, which are associated with death. So this is really something we should target as much as possible to avoid complications uh, in those patients, as you know, who are exposed to higher rates of complications because of the DNA uh, Reaper uh, background. The other analysis were quite usual. So as you can see, with about eight, uh, <clears throat> 13 patients, there was a little bit equilibrium uh, between uh, 2014 before and after. Uh, the sex ratio was one, uh, many, as, as I told you, it was pediatric patients, median age, nine years. Uh, and uh, the median follow-up was quite robust because it was 3.7 years, uh, uh, <coughs> allowing to uh, sing the these results, even if they are coming from a registry, they are robust. So the first message is that when you are transplanted from Fanconi patients, uh, in the pediatric times, the overall survival is outstanding, five years, uh, 83% for this uh, disease that, uh, as you may know, 80% of the patients are presenting with a plastic anemia or ML and MDS before the age of 20. So now, I mean, the main message for that study is that even in, in 2022, you see that there is a drastic impact uh, on donor type that match family donor and match unrelated donor are doing quite the same at five years. However, when you look to mismatch donor <clears throat> or mismatch unrelated donor hair flow, uh, uh, you see that there is a drastic changes with a less uh, good overall survival in those patients. However, what we did is a, of course, multivariate analysis to try to better understand what was conditioning best prognosis and overall survival in this uh, situation. So the donor type was definitely something that was going on. It was also uh, the flu side as conditioning regimen was doing better. And the uh, surprise, because it was one of the aims of the study, but it was really something that we are not expecting. It was that alentuzumab as a T cell depletion in vivo uh, conditioning regimen was uh, significantly associated with better overall survival. So then, as I told you, what we were targeting is really the graft versus host disease free overall survival. So that's what we define as GRFS with patients not presenting grade three to four acute graft versus disease, no extensive graft versus disease, no graft feral and relapse post transplant. And this condition, as you can see, the overall GRFS was about 70% uh, five years, which is not nothing in this situation. And uh, uh, again, uh, the, um, um, uh, uh, overall, the GRFS was uh, 
uh, definitely. Uh, so let me just quit this bit. Yeah, sorry for this. So again, the GRFS was deeply involved and uh, related to a match uh, uh, unrelated donor. You see that the match family donor and the match unrelated donor uh, were doing far better than the mismatch donor. So the message here was that, uh, again, uh, a, a Fanconi patient that is transplanted with a match donor is doing great. However, uh, we see that for mismatch donors, whatever they are, unrelated or haplo, uh, you have uh, drastic differences and still improvement to rise. So again, we look on the factors uh, uh, possibly associated with uh, better prognosis. Again, donor type, I told you. And again, an enthusiumab in uh, the T-cell in vivo depletion setting was doing uh, better than the rest. So basically, this study was, uh, I think, nice, first of all, to see that we still need to do some progress is mismatch transplantation for patients with Fanconi anemia. And the second one was that for the first time, we showed that alentuzumab as a T-cell depletion in vivo setting might be able to give rise to better results, to lower chronic graft-associated disease, and in a way to protect patients uh, uh, of uh, secondary malignancies. As you know, in this setting, this is the major complications associated with overall survival. So the next study is that, uh, of course, uh, was for me very striking and interesting, was on mismatch donors uh, for Fanconi patients, as I showed to you that it was really something challenging today and that still need improvements. This uh, study has been uh, presented by Carmen Bonfin that I'm sure everybody of you knows very well. She's working in Curitiba. Uh, she's uh, uh, as expert as she's nice, uh, doing a, a wonderful work in Fanconi patients and transplantation. And here she was reported her experience comparing uh, patients with Fanconi anemia who received a cold blood transplantation or a haplo transplantation. So basically, uh, it was really a study to compare what we have accessing more at the moment, haplo PTCY uh, in Fanconi patients and cold blood as an alternative donor of stem cells. So, of course, it was a multinational study, but basically, when you look to the patients, they were mainly coming from Curitiba, where Dr. Bonfin is working, with half patients receiving haplo-PTCI uh, cord and half patients receiving cold blood. Some things that I have to precise before going further is that uh, for cold blood, there was a fludarabin by, I would say, classical regimen, no surprise. On the other side, when you look to the haplo patients, there was two bunch of patients. There was one who receive a PTCY ATG, mainly samoglobulin vice regimen, 37 patients. And in the most recent years, Carmen uh, introduced alentuzumab in the conditioning regimen of haplo transplantation and, and what I would call PTCY alentuzumab core. For the rest, it was exactly as usual, looking for endpoints like survival, GVHD, graph error, and GRFS. So the first information on that core of patients is that uh, the CMV reactivation, I would say infections in Aplo was much higher than in port, as well as hemorrhage excitis, as you can see here. I should recall at that stage that in Brazil, they don't have access to letermovir. And as you know, uh, these drugs has drastically changed the CMV profile in our patients, especially for patients who are highly immunosuppressed and patients who are receiving mismatch donor transplantation. Regarding Graf-Assus-Sauce disease, again, there was a detrimental effect of haplo, at least for acute graf assus disease, there was no change, but for the chronic graf assus disease that I told you is related to secondary malignancies, haplo was twice the rates of cold blood. However, as a surprise came from rejection rates, I would say it's not a big surprise to see that cold blood is associated with graft rejection. There was about 30% patients in the cold blood group who rejected, and this number was about three in the haplo setting. And as you can see, of course, the patients were treated again, transplanted again for some of them. And on the right side of my screen, you see that outside the 16 patients who were in graft failure overall, only one was alive long-term, a patient was cured by a haplo-PTCY secondary bone marrow transplantation. 
If now, of course, we come to transplant-related mortality, and if what I told you, basically what has been showed uh, in this study is that uh, when you are using haplo, there was some higher rates of graft associated disease, but basically when you go to court, the patients are hiring exposed to graft failure and death. And when you look to the cumulative incidences of TRM at D, uh, 180, you see that the uh, toxicity related to cord was significantly higher than the toxicity that was observed with haplo. So now if we look for uh, two-year overall survival, I told you the overall median survival is nice in this cord of patients. You see that the overall survival was about 60% five years. And then uh, when you are dissecting the disease according to haplo or unrelated donors, cold blood unrelated donors, you see that there was a drastic change and an improvement using haplo with PTCY in the setting of FA. And the last information that I think is important to see is that for the 10 patients who relieve an entuzumab and a haplo donor, they are all alive at the moment. So basically, this uh, court, uh, I think, is very important. Of course, there is a lot of limitations. Uh, it's a retrospective setting. The number of patients is not so high. Uh, but however, uh, the uh, centers is mainly Curitiba, with, we can imagine, a kind of homogeneous practice. And as you can see, it was shown that Haplo was doing better than court with, a, I would say, an acceptable grad failure rates of uh, unrelated core blood transplantation. But as you saw, uh, there is also main progress to do with haplo setting, especially in the sense of graft versus disease. The patients were exposed to high rates of chronic graft versus disease that we don't want to see in FA patients. I would not say anything on CMV reactivation since most of us have access to letamovir, which simplify uh, this uh, uh, complication. What you also saw, in both presentation and FA settings is the place that alentezumab could take, not only in much unrelated donor, but in uh, um, uh, uh, airflow uh, setting. I just would like to recommend to use this paper that just came out, that is the same group, Carmen Bofin, who did an excellent review on Fanconi patients, especially with mismatched donors. She is really detailing of what she did to come to this PTCY alentezumab regimen and I think that more than words, all is in this study, and I advise you to read it. So now, uh, to continue with, I could not not speak about that study. That is a uh, basically study on a large number of patients to a bit explain better the clonal evolution in the context of a plastic anemia. Basically, we do know that patients with a plastic anemia are exposed to a high rates of clonal evolution, but we don't really know how it works. This study has been done in two parts. The first one was really clearly clinical to really assess what was the clinical determinants uh, to a clonal evolution in a plastic anemia. The second part was more biology. And uh, I decided then to do an overview of what has been said at TBMT to kind of summarizing what we do know what's going on at the moment. So this study was a multi-center study. Uh, we put together uh, uh, <coughs> patients from Cleveland Clinic Ohio, United States, uh, from uh, our institution in Paris, and from Rivero Preto, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, in Brazil. So what is very important, as you can see, is that we were able to include 1,000 patients, a little bit more than 1,000 patients with a plastic anemia. We had about 1,000 patients who were eligible for the analysis. We transplanted 117 patients first line, and then we studied for clonal evolution, basically 882 patients, some of them being presenting with hemolytic PNH, 103, and the other one presenting with severe or very severe plastic anemia, also a moderate setting, uh, 779 uh, patients. So what we should recall uh, from that study, first of all, and this is something that is really important, from the 117 patients who were transplanted first line, using mainly sibling donor, as you can see, there was no clonal evolution. So of course it's obvious, but this is also illustrating how important it is as much as we can with a, a sibling available donor, uh, is when a sibling donor is available to transplant those patients up front to avoid to them the complications afterwards, namely cyclosporin dependence, relapse, 
refractoring or clonal evolution with MDS, AML, but also with PMH that is really impacting the life of our patients. Then when you look to the patients who are not transplanted up front, 882, you can see that the overall survival was not so bad, about 76% at 10 years. And if we come back to clonal evolution, you can see that there was <clears throat> no difference between a plastic anemia being associated or not uh, with PNH. It was about uh, 13%, 2.8% for plastic anemia alone, 13.1% for uh, plastic anemia in PNH uh, at 10 years. However, what has been shown is that the patients with hemolytic PNH, 103 patients, were less exposed to uh, um, uh, 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 clonal evolution in this setting. The other thing that is important for the following of our patients, showing how it's important to do some marrow sampling regularly, at least every 18 months with cytogenetic analysis, is that there is no difference in terms of clonal evolution for patients with moderate or severe plastic anemia. In other words, it's not because your patient is presenting with a moderate plastic anemia that is not exposed to do a clonal evolution uh, in the next 10 years. Then we were able to assess the prognostic factor for progression. And basically there is two main factors. First of all, being refractory to immunosuppression. Those patients have to be carefully followed, transplanted if possible, because they have a higher exposition to clonal evolution. H at diagnosis was also very important. As you can see, older you are, uh, more you are exposed to clonal evolution in a plastic anemia. Just one word on the prognosis of those patients, uh, about those 94 patients out of the 1,000 patients from the beginning who progressed. It was mainly MDS, as you can see, 71. The other ones were AML. And as you can see, the overall survival was not very good, with about 30% long term. What was really important, it was the blast at diagnosis with this level of more or less than 5%. Than this is, again, highlighting how important it is in our patients to follow the marrow, to see if cytogenetic abnormalities, classifying them for MDS is appearing, and then proceeding to transplant as quick as possible before blast will be appear and morphological transformation going on. So now, of course, I could not not speak about molecular uh, somatic mutations in the plastic anemia and the talk that has been given by Austin Kulakase Barrage it's not a scientific presentation. It was during an educational setting, but there was in that uh, presentation a lot of uh, data coming uh, from the bench and uh, considered as scientific. So basically the questions in the plastic anemia, is there any role of myeloid mutations, cancer genes uh, uh, in the transformation of our patients? So as you know, we just published in the New England Journal uh, this randomized study. Uh, who uh, was a, a phase a three multinational study. The uh, sponsor was uh, EBMT, and uh, there was about uh, six EBMT countries who participated with 24 sites, who included about 200 patients uh, between 2014 and 2019. So it was a simple randomization, one-to-one -one of patients uh, who were receiving for severe plastic anemia or very severe plastic anemia the standard of care associated also ATG plus cyclosporine or the uh, uh, same treatment plus l thrombopack. The force of that trial is that there was a biological centralized setting for samples. Uh, all samples were sending to King's baseline six months after treatment and at 24 months. So we were able to assess the role of mutations in this cohort of patients with uh, a, a very regular setting. So just to recall the clinical uh, 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 um, uh, results, uh, I'm sure that you hear about, the primary endpoint was rich. We were able to say that there was at three months a drastic improvement in terms of complete response, three times higher chance of response in patients who receive all ATG plus cyclosporine plus and thrombopag. Uh, and that was uh, at six months uh, turning in a, a better overall response in patients. As you can see here on the left uh, downside of my slides, there was about 30% higher chance of overall response for patients who were receiving all ATG plus cyclosporine plus cell thrombopath. So as you can see, the standard arm was a bit lower in terms of response. So just to recall that we considered 
as EBMT uh, patients to be as a partial responders is if, if he is transfusion independent. However, NIH uh, consider a patient as, trans, as, as partial responder if a single lineage is, is improving at six months. So if you are now classifying the race patients according to the NIH criteria, you really found what has been published by NIH2, uh, means that you have 66% of patients that are responding six months to immunosuppression uh, versus 76% when you're adding a trauma pack to it. And finally, at six months, you have no more improvement in the standard treatment, while you have uh, about 80% almost patients responding to the association of force ATG plus cyclosporine plus cell trauma pack. Anyway, it was just to recall the uh, clinical events. Uh, there was no safety concern and no difference arms, but the force of that study was also being able uh, to study the uh, cytogenetic evolution and somatic myeloid cancer gene mutations in that trial. As you can see, there was no differences in terms of cytogenetics mutations in that trial with two patients uh, presenting cytogenetics classifying for MDS in the standard arm and two patients in the experimental arms. And so what we did, I told you baseline, six months and 24 months after treatment was to assess 31 gene that has been targeted as a molecular viral code. Uh, and we were looking to them, you know those genes very well. Uh, they have been described largely in AML, in AMDS. And what uh, was a bit of a surprise was to see that uh, basically we had a tremendous number of myeloid cancer gene mutations in patients with aplastic anemia. As you can see at diagnosis, the blue is representing arm A, the, the, the orange is representing arm B. Uh, there was about 30% of patients who were presenting with uh, mutas somatic mutations at diagnosis. And as you know, and I showed you before, as the expected clonal evolution as morphology can be as an AMR is about 10%, 10 years. So obviously, those somatic mutations in the context of a plastic anemia has nothing to do with what has been defined or what it could be uh, impacted in MDS and AML. And most striking, as you can see at six months, it was not 30%, but 60% of our patients were presented with all um, um, different uh, myeloid cancer gene mutations, showing again that the significance of those mutations is drastically different and that patients should not be transplanted just because they are presenting mutations in the context of a plastic anemia. And more importantly, as you can see, there was absolutely no differences between the patients who were receiving l pack or patients who were receiving the standard of care. So, of course, we're looking in all senses if those mutations might have been impacting somewhere the response of the overall resp response of those patients. As you can see here, according to mutations presented baseline, uh, we were looking for response rate at three months, six months, and uh, you uh, saw the numbers. We were even observing more response in patients with mutations. It was not significant, but just to say that, please, don't transplant those patients because they have mutations. In terms of overall survival, you can see here, mutations or no mutations was not changing anything. Of course, we also did some landmark analysis six months to see if patients who were presenting yes or no mutations at six months were exposed to something different. Basically, we didn't find any difference in terms of response rates, and we also did not find anything in terms of overall survival. Finally, we also did an analysis on patients who are presenting new mutations between baseline and six months. They might be a little bit different in terms of response rate, but again, it was not significant statistically speaking, and in terms of overall survival, it didn't change anything. So, of, of course, it's not a scientific abstract, but I think that this presentation was quite important to recontextualize the role of mutations in the plastic anemia, which is completely different than what has been reported in AML and MDS. The last abstracts I would like to present to you is of course the studies that, that the subgroup analysis that has been presented by uh, Dr. Stelsch uh, about GRFS in the context of treosulfan uh, based conditioning regimen compared with busulfan uh, based ones. So I think you all remembered that trial that has been published two years ago was a non-inferiority trial who was comparing 
uh, Triel Sulfan by his regiment to uh, Fudarbin by his regiment, Busulfan by his regiment in patients with AML or MDS and uh, uh, older patients with or without comorbidities. Basically, what has been found in that study, it was that the trail sulfam groups was associated with a better EFS and a better overall survival with a, a less uh, a toxicity related to transplant. However, as you know, it was a bunch of patients merging MDS and AML patients. And what did Dr. Stills is to present at the EBMT, uh, the results of a subgroup analysis in patients with MDS only. Basically, what he showed is that there was an even free survival for patients to receive a triosyl fund by his regimen. There was less acute graphic source disease, less chronic graphic source disease. And the other thing that I found important, it was that the difference was more striking in high risk patients. As you can see here from left to right, there was a higher chance of uh, being alive uh, without disease uh, and without relapse uh, if you have a higher rates of uh, blasts. So basically, this study, a subgroup analysis of the primary studies that has been reported in the Lancet hematology, was able to show that trilsulfan uh, fludarabine by his regimen was associated with a better even free survival as compared with buflu in patients aged 50 years or more associated with MDS, high risk or with comorbidities. So this is what I found striking from the last EBMT in the field of bone marrow failure. So basically for Falconi, I think that the results in kids are very good and those patients should be transplanted as soon as possible if a sibling donor, a match unrelated donor is available. We also do see from the severe plastic and their working party study that alentuzumab might even improve the results of the mud transplantation setting, improving significantly and statistically significantly overall survival and GRFS, decreasing the rates of chronic graphic source disease, which is definitely something that we have to work on in this setting. We also uh, uh, identified from that EBMT coming from the Brazilian group and especially Carmen Bonfin that haplotransplant would be able to do very well uh, in those patients. Uh, the main limitations were CMV infections, but you know that we have letamovir that is available in this setting. And the other possibility to improvement is clearly the haplopTC while alentuzumab protocols that uh, Carmen set up. Uh, and that looks very interesting in that uh, particular severe uh, population of patients. The other learning that we got from that EBMT was on clonal evolution in the plastic anemia. Basically, we identified the refractory disease and other patients as those ones who have to be carefully followed uh, to avoid to discover clonal evolution at the morphological stages. Uh, we also found out that if you have, of course, a more prominent disease at time of diagnosis, the prognosis long-term will be worse. The reason, again, to follow those patients carefully with marrow sampling at least every 12 to 18 months. And as I was illustrating to you, the role of somatic mutations in the plastic anemia that is still unexplained with a lot of research going on at the moment, it's clearly not somatic mutations all associated with clonal evolution to MDS and AML. And we really need to dissect these populations to know exactly what's going on uh, in this setting. Finally, the last study that I found interesting was this triosulfan busulfan regimen, who was showing better results uh, for the triosulfan uh, based regimen, especially in patients with high risk MDS, holders and 50 with comorbidities. With that, I'd like to thank very much, of course, uh, all the people uh, from my center working on the French Reference Center, as well as people at EBMT level. I mean, as you can see, uh, most of the studies are coming of the international collaboration on behalf of EBMT, and that would not be possible in another way. I'm not presenting my results, but the results of the group. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be more than happy to answer your questions.